And we have a special birthday gift uh, to celebrate that anniversary. That is the Max Schmidt Heine Lecture, sponsored by the Max Schmidt Heine Foundation, a foundation committed to promoting economic freedom and social order. It's been a longtime partner of the St. Gallen Symposium. Our special guest to deliver the lecture is Professor Neil Ferguson, the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of History at Harvard, and the William Ziegler Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. He previously taught at NYU and Oxford University. As you all know, he's a major historian of our time, a best-selling author, world-renowned pundit on global politics and economics. It's my great honor to present to you Professor Neil Ferguson. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here for the first time in St. Gallen, and a particular pleasure to be invited uh, to a conference on the crucial subject of entrepreneurship. I listened with great interest to the panel that uh, just concluded, and I seem to remember hearing Lord Giddens say, correct me if I'm wrong, that history was not a good guide to the problems that we face in our ever-changing 21st century world. Well, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that I disagree with that. <laughs> I'm going to uh, give you a relatively brief talk. I've been instructed not to overshoot 25 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have time for uh, discussion. Let me, uh, let me just begin by reflecting a little bit uh, on where we are economically. Let's focus, as we conclude this wonderful conference. I've just been leafing through the program, and I'm hugely impressed at the uh, organizational feat uh, that you've pulled off. Let's, let's focus <coughs> on the things that entrepreneurs have to worry about most. Economic conditions, let's face it, more than climate. What caused this crisis? And what is this crisis? Because I think fairly clearly, it's not over. If you look at the performance of the biggest economy in the world, which is the US economy, you can see from this chart, which just looks at changes in quarterly GDP growth, that the recession the United States has just been through is not by any means the sharpest, deepest recession uh, of modern times. Uh, but it's certainly the longest. We had four quarters of uninterrupted contraction in the US economy. So something unusual has happened here. But certainly in these terms, it's nothing close to the cataclysmic 30% contraction in output of the Great Depression. Let's look at household wealth. I agree, not the most important of all things, uh, but nevertheless important to many people. I did a little calculation of household net worth for the United States in relation to gross domestic product. And one of the things that's quite striking about household net worth measured this way is it really didn't change terribly much for most of the post-war period. And then, beginning in 1995, there were two extraordinary bubbles. One way of characterizing the crisis that we're currently in is that for about 10 years, Americans thought they were much richer than they really were. First because of dot-com mania, and then because of the real estate uh, speculation mania. Those manias have been and gone, and now Americans have gone back to being what they were in 1995. Rich, but not that rich. From a global vantage point, there's been much discussion of whether there's been decoupling. And I've heard in the discussion uh, that you've just been having an interesting implicit dialogue about the relative positions of the developing or emerging world and the developed world. Well, what you can see from this chart, which shows uh, real GDP annual percentage growth rates going back to 1980, is that decoupling has in fact happened already. And it happened around about the same time that Americans began to hallucinate about their wealth. From the mid-1990s, the trend growth rate of emerging or developing economies rose relative to the trend growth rate uh, of developed economies. And what's interesting is that the crisis did not fundamentally alter 
that divergence. It was a recession in the developed world. It was a growth slowdown in the developing world. And that seems to me an extremely important perspective to bear in mind as one tries to understand where we are. How did it happen? How did that great downward spike in developed world production come about? Well, of course, there are legions of people offering you answers to that question. The bookshelves groan under the weight of books on the subject. But I think I can make a reasonable claim uh, to have beaten most of those authors to the punch uh, since my book on the subject uh, was written before the crisis in anticipation of the crisis and was therefore available when the crisis happened rather than after it. <laughs> the Ascent of Money is uh, really a, a simple run-through financial history which also attempts to answer the question why the crisis? I don't think you can answer that question in less than six parts. You've got to be very wary of monocausal explanations. They're doing the rounds at the moment, as I'll show you in just a second. But this seems to me like a credible answer to the question. Part of the cause of the crisis was excessive bank leverage. That seems clear on both sides of the Atlantic. Then there was the misrating of toxic assets by the rating agencies. Without that, you can't really understand the excessive leverage on bank balance sheets, which was partly predicated on bogus AAA-rated uh, collateralized debt obligations and mortgage-backed securities. We mustn't forget that there was a major error of monetary policy at the US Fed, which kept interest rates too low between 2002 and 2004. And then we must include in our explanation the role of a completely unregulated and very novel market uh, for derivatives things like uh, credit default swaps. And that clearly played an important part in the crisis, most obviously its role in the collapse of the big insurer, AIG. The fifth part is the obvious part, the unscrupulous uh, sale of mortgages. Remember, though, that that drive to increase home ownership and increase household debt was politically underwritten. Both parties in Congress were enthusiastic proponents of the idea that the home ownership rates should go up. And we ran a really interesting experiment in the United States. It was great fun. We decided to find out what percentage of households uh, could own their own homes before a massive financial crisis happened. And the answer is 69. The, fifth, uh, the sixth, rather, and final part of the explanation for the crisis I want to offer you is uh, what I call Chimerica. The symbiotic relationship between China and the United States which made it possible for a $2.5 trillion credit line to be extended by China uh, to the United States through reserve accumulation, designed mainly to keep China's currency from appreciating. If you take that away, it's really hard to imagine the property bubble exploding the way it did, because the role of Chimerica kept long-term interest rates in the US probably 150 or 200 basis points lower than they would otherwise have been. So, that is my six-part explanation for the crisis. I can't do it more parsimoniously than that. Take any one of those away, and it seems to me the explanation is incomplete. Now let me introduce you to a monocausal explanation of the crisis, which is in danger of becoming fashionable, uh, if not conventional wisdom, in the United States. And it's made by uh, uh, Paul Krugman, the uh, Nobel Prize-winning economist, and a New York Times columnist. In a whole succession of columns that he's written since the crisis uh, began, uh, a crisis which incidentally he in no way anticipated, Professor Krugman uh, has written as follows, quote, Reagan era legislative changes essentially ended New Deal restrictions on mortgage lending. It was only after the Reagan deregulation that thrift gradually disappeared. It was the explosion of debt that made the US economy so vulnerable. The financial system, also mainly thanks to Reagan-era deregulation, took on too much risk with too little capital. Compare those dreadful days of deregulation with the golden age that went before. I quote, The long period of stability after World War II was based on a combination of deposit insurance, 
which eliminated the threat of bank runs, and strict regulation of bank balance sheets, including both limits on risky lending and limits on leverage, the extent to which banks were allowed to finance investments with borrowed funds. The era of boring banking was also an era of spectacular economic progress. So that is an alternative explanation for the crisis. It was all the fault of those dreadful Reagan Republicans. One reason that I'm highly skeptical about this proposition uh, is that it appears Professor Krugman has forgotten the 1970s. Uh, now, I'm old enough to have quite a clear memory of the 1970s, and I'm here to tell you that it was very far from the golden age of regulated finance of Professor Krugman's imagining. The much tighter bank regulation of the 1970s, and it was certainly very tight, as anybody who worked in financial services can confirm, coincided with, well, much more expensive and less efficient finance from the point of view of consumers, the protection of very inefficient managements from any kind of corporate raids, banking crises, oh yes, there were big banking crises in the 1970s, a spectacular one in Britain, the secondary banking crisis, and, crucially, negative real returns on almost every financial instrument you could care to name, from savings accounts through bonds to stocks. This was the era of stagflation, low growth, high inflation. Take a look. Uh, this chart shows you uh, real returns uh, on bonds and stocks uh, uh, for the United States and the United Kingdom. I'm sorry, only on bonds. Uh, for the United States and the United Kingdom. The story for stocks is not much better. And as you can see, in Professor Krugman's golden age of highly regulated finance, investors consistently lost out. In every single post-war decade, investors in fixed income had negative real returns. Hey, what a golden age. Let's go back there. I can't wait. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get historical here. Let's get back to our roots. Let's get back to the birth of true entrepreneurship that produced this. This is the most important chart you can really find in all economic history. It tells you that something absolutely incredible happened that was called the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution transformed life, first for the English, and then gradually for everybody else. In some cases, not so gradually. As you can see, the trend growth uh, of per capita output was more or less uh, flat right the way through the Middle Ages, right the way through the early modern period, right into the middle of the 18th century, and then, pow, take off. A spectacular increase in the productivity of the individual worker. That is the single most important thing that happened in economic history. Sounds like the Industrial Revolution hasn't quite reached our sound system. <laughs> or maybe that was a steam engine. <laughs> Talking of which, here is a steam engine. No, it wasn't an intentional sound effect, rest assured. The technology, the key inventions that made the Industrial Revolution happen, uh, really could not have come into existence without entrepreneurship. It wasn't just what, having the idea. It was Bolton making it a business. In all of the key inventions, the steam engine, the spinning jenny, the rocket, the first uh, steam-powered locomotive, the steel-making converter, it was the nexus between innovation and entrepreneurship that made it happen. The state played a negligible role though not a non-existent role, but a negligible role in this great transformation. The British state was not radically different in the way that it operated in, let's say, 1820, compared with the way that it had operated in 1760. So it's very hard to attribute this extraordinary transformation to the role played by government. Greg Clark has a wonderful and fascinating a book about the Industrial Revolution with the wonderful, with the excellent title, A Farewell to Arms. And this table is taken from that. And what it shows you is the contribution made by different sectors of the economy uh, to the growth of what he calls national 
efficiency. One of the striking things about this table, and that's why I put a red box around it, is how crucially important textiles were to the Industrial Revolution. That's enough steam engine. Now, it may seem trivial to say that industrialization is all about clothes, but it is. And that's a really important point because I find when I'm teaching the Industrial Revolution that most students glaze over until I point out to them that it's all about clothes. More clothes. Ever larger wardrobes. The big difference between uh, the Industrial Age and what went before it Do you think Paul is blocking my sound? Paul, you are such a bad loser. I don't know if technical, I don't know if technical support can help me out here. Is it a dud microphone? Right, kill the one around my head. I always feel a bit like Michael Jackson with those mics. <laughs> now I'm more like Jay Z. <laughs> so clothes are crucial. And the technology that made it possible to manufacture clothes much more efficiently was also the technology that made it possible for the people making them to buy more. The key point is that our demand for clothes is almost infinitely elastic. And if you don't believe me, take a look at your partner's clothes when you get home. And here's what technology did. Uh, this uh, chart simply shows you the way in which the prices of cotton manufacturers were driven down by relentless innovation, relentless competition. This is a highly competitive, entrepreneur-driven process. And of course, it's a familiar one. Because every industrial revolution that has happened in the world since then has been propelled by this same process. They start with textile mills. Japanese were the first Asian country to get this. In the late 19th century, there were textile mills all over Japan that were doing to the British what the British had won once done to the Indians. <coughs> One of the things that's fascinating about Clark's book is he shows the speed, uh, or in some cases, lack of speed, with which technological innovations traveled geographically. So these are the time lags measured in years uh, in the international diffusion of inventions. So just to take an example, although the first cotton mill exists in 1771, it takes 19 years for a cotton mill to be built in Ireland, and 64 years for a cotton mill to be built in Mexico. There's some evidence of a process of acceleration uh, over time, but when one looks at this uh, table, the most striking thing is the relative slowness with which these brilliant new ways of doing things spread. Once again, when they spread successfully, as they did, for example, to Germany, it was entrepreneurs that did it. The role of the state in this process was minimal. I want at this point to quote some extremely well-known but important passages uh, from Joseph Schumpeter, the great uh, theorist of entrepreneurship. This, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is how industrial capitalism worked. This evolutionary impulse Schumpeter wrote in Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion comes from the new forms of industrial organization that capitalist enterprise creates. The same process of industrial mutation incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating a new one. This process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. And I believe that is still true. In another work, his theory of economic development, Schumpeter made it a little clearer quite what he meant by creative destruction. This is what he said. This economic system cannot do without the ultima ratio of the complete destruction of those existences which are irretrievably associated with the hopelessly unadapted. You can tell that he was originally a German speaker by that sentence. An indiscriminate and general increase in credit facilities means simply inflation, which destroys that measure of selection which can still be ascribed to the depression and burdens the economic system with those firms that are unfit to live. Now, those of you who've studied uh, natural science, uh, and particularly the theory of evolution, will recognize the profound influence that Darwinian thought 
had on Schumpeter. And what's rather elegant is uh, our relatively recent realization that Darwin, in writing The Origin of Species, was himself in turn influenced by economic theorists of the 19th century, uh, not least uh, Thomas uh, Malthus. So there is a long tradition of thinking about the economic process in evolutionary terms. Natural selection, which we see in the world of biology, is also a feature of capitalist economic life. And that's really the point about creative destruction. There are supposed to be extinctions. There are supposed to be things that don't survive. Ladies and gentlemen, our world is not so very different from that world, despite what the learned sociologist said earlier. The song remains fundamentally the same as new technologies are devised. He never gives up. As new technologies, including microphones that work, are devised and slowly diffuse until they reach Switzerland. <laughs> My colleague at Harvard Business School, Diego Common, has done some wonderful work uh, on the diffusion of technology. Uh, what he shows here is how, a new, uh, how quickly a new technology spreads until it reaches uh, a critical percentage of US households. He goes right back uh, to the earliest uh, breakthroughs of the consumer society circa 1900, the telephone, the automobile. But as you can see, if you follow this chart, and I think it's a wonderful piece of work, uh, the pace of adoption is markedly more rapid uh, by the end of the century, by comparison with the beginning. It takes next to no time at all for the cell phone uh, to be owned by a majority of Americans. Far, far more rapid, as you can see, than the landline uh, telephone. So the song remains the same, but it is unquestionably speeded up. The process of industrialization, though it has much in common with its early variant, is now a more rapid process. And there I entirely agree with Lord Giddens about the way in which communication technology has propelled the process. It took ages for news to travel in the early 19th century days, weeks, months, if it had to go all the way from London to Calcutta. Now the same information about a new way of doing things can be transmitted in seconds. And that, of course, is why new ideas spread much more quickly and new fashions, new models, new technologies are so swiftly adopted. As a fellow of the Hoover Institute at Stanford, I spend some time every year uh, out on the West Coast, uh, and I'm never... I never cease to be amazed by the vitality and the creativity of Silicon Valley. And this uh, graphic of Silicon Valley is just, as you can see, a jumble of startups, a jumble of companies. Uh, the most optimistic people I know, although all, oddly also the most cynical, are the venture capitalists of the Valley. And throughout this financial crisis, they have been the least perturbed. Of all the people I know, in the business world, they remained fundamentally optimistic that the innovation machine and the entrepreneurship machine would carry on functioning, no matter what. And they had history on their side. As I said earlier, the 1970s were no economic picnic. But it was in the 1970s, in the midst of stagflation, that Bill Gates created his company and Steve Jobs, just a year later, created his. So, innovation, and entrepreneurship, still the drivers. I want to ask you, what are the principal threats to those two drivers of economic growth? Because I believe there are some serious threats in the world today, threats that certainly were undreamt of in the Darwinian world of 19th century industrialism. The first concern that I have is that we may end up introducing some very poorly designed financial regulation, the net effects of which is to prevent the evolutionary process from functioning in the financial world. We are going to institutionalize the too big to fail institutions in just the same way as one might imagine uh, the dinosaurs being kept on life support after that great meteor hit the earth and put them out of business. So number one concern 
is the institutionalization of too big to fail. The reason that concerns me is that if we establish a state underwritten oligopoly in all the major financial centers of the West, there will be a major impediment to financial innovation. After all previous financial crises in history, new banks were founded. A crisis is a great opportunity, by and large, to establish a new bank, one that has an absolutely clean reputational sheet. That process has basically stalled in the United States. You will look in vain for new banks in America today. And one reason that it's stalled is that a new bank cannot compete with these so-called systemically important too-big-to-fail institutions with their wonderful combination of free money from the Fed and an implicit guarantee to be bailed out if they blow themselves up. The second threat uh, to entrepreneurship that I detect in the world today is that we may have another error of monetary policy. Because I don't see any evidence that the monetary policy makers, that the central bankers, have radically revised their theory of what they do. Remember the great moderation, that wonderful lecture, so laden with hubris, that Ben Bernanke gave in 2004? Some moderation, Ben. Some moderation you gave us with your wonderful uh, combination of the Greenspan put and an implicit inflation target. These guys could screw up again. And if they do, well, nothing could be more disruptive. Because as we know, it's hugely hard to be a successful entrepreneur when time inconsistent monetary policy is being inflicted uh, on your currency. The third threat is a product of the huge fiscal crisis that all Western countries find themselves in. And that threat is that we will attempt deficit reduction with precisely the wrong mix. Raising taxes uh, uh, on income and on corporations. Uh, reducing incentives uh, for entrepreneurs rather than seeking to weigh uh, the taxation burden more uh, on consumption. The political drivers for that kind of taxation are very obvious today. And such is the magnitude of the fiscal crisis that all the Western economies face that it's hard to be optimistic about how these things will turn out. Finally, a major threat to entrepreneurship is the likely default on debt that many Western countries uh, will end up uh, experiencing. Since the fiscal arithmetic is really so hideous, and I just have time to show you how hideous it is. First, the monetary overhang. This is what uh, monetary policy looks like when you're trying to avert a Great Depression. And credit where it's due, Bernanke did do that. This massive expansion of the Fed's balance sheet was unquestionably one thing that prevented us rerunning the Great Depression. But it's still a major monetary overhang. And it's by no means certain that the policies of quantitative easing that have been used on both sides of the Atlantic can be un unwound as readily as they were unrolled. But I'm more worried about this. This is the fiscal hangover that follows a policy of massive uh, counter-cyclical stimulus. You can see that we currently have in the United States the fiscal policy of a world war without the world war. Debt in relation to GDP is rapidly rising towards the 100% mark, uh, which it last saw at the end of World War II. And by the way, just in parenthesis, if you're wondering how the US got its debt burden down after World War II, the answer is that it was done half by economic growth and half by inflation, and not at all by running budgetary primary surpluses. And the story for the United Kingdom uh, is similar, though inflation played a much larger role and growth a much smaller role. You've all heard about the pigs, and no doubt there's been a certain amount of smug Swiss self-congratulation that the predicament of Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain is in no way shared uh, by Switzerland. And I share, in some ways, your sentiments when I look at these figures produced by the Bank for International Settlements, also in Switzerland, showing the unsustainable trajectory of fiscal policy in these countries. What you can see there in these charts is that the baseline scenario, assuming no change of policy, drives the debt-GDP ratio soaring skywards towards the 300% mark 
in the space uh, of 30 years. But now look at the United Kingdom and the United States, and you will be struck by the fact that the position is in fact worse in both those economies. UK fiscal policy is set to drive the debt-GDP ratio above 500%, and US fiscal policy to around 450% of GDP. These are impossible numbers. These things won't happen. But it does supply me with my favorite headline, <laughs> a headline that I wasn't allowed to use by the Financial Times uh, editor, Lionel Barber, who I think is a big killjoy for stopping me. In theory, there are six ways out of a debt crisis. Higher growth, lower the interest rate on the public debt, get a bailout from abroad, run primary surpluses via tax increases or public spending cuts, spring unanticipated inflation on investors, or simply default. Well, actually, correction. Uh, three of those are impossible, particularly uh, for the United States. I mean, who is going to bail out the United States? Greece, yes. I don't think the United States is quite within the IMF's power. So in fact, there are only three things that can be done. And none of those three things is particularly attractive from the vantage point of an entrepreneur working in the English-speaking world. You're either going to get clobbered uh, by higher taxes, or by unanticipated inflation, or by a default event. The most recent industrial revolution is, of course, the Chinese Industrial Revolution. And one of the striking things about this revolution is that it is in every way bigger than the original British Industrial Revolution, and it is also much faster. What this chart shows you is the multiple uh, increase in GDP that occurred in the industrialization period. The UK GDP increased by a factor of 4.4 in 70 years. China's GDP increased by a factor of 10.3 in just 26 years. This is the biggest and fastest industrial revolution ever. The question I want to leave you to ponder is whether, given our parlous predicament and their ability uh, to roll out an industrial revolution on an unprecedented scale, is Paul Krugman under that table? <laughs> Just when I was getting to Goldman Sachs, <laughs> or giant squid, as they uh, are now colloquially known uh, in Wall Street, uh, it's actually a Goldman Sachs projection that says that China's GDP will equal that uh, of the United States in 2027. And then, of course, if you look at that chart, uh, be more than double US GDP by mid-century. Now, I'm a historian, and I'm here to tell you that history isn't like this. This is not how things will play out. There will be all kinds of interruptions and breaks and discontinuities. The lines are never smooth. But if you had done a similar projection for Britain and Japan, say 130 years ago, it certainly wouldn't have been smooth, but it would have been right in the end. The trajectory may be bumpier than this, but the probability is that this is where we're heading. And that has major implications for entrepreneurship, for the obvious reason that it implies that the most successful economy of the 21st century will be one run by a communist party. What we most need, ladies and gentlemen, is the one thing that the 1970s had in copious supply, entrepreneurs. Western entrepreneurs, like the inimitable cast of my favorite 1970s soap, Dynasty. I think Dynasty was one of the few good things about the 1970s. And I think that because it so relentlessly glamorized the lives of entrepreneurs, of businessmen. I'm not sure that the shoulder pads will ever make a comeback. <laughs> You'll be relieved to hear but I very much hope that Western entrepreneurs will make a comeback, uh, because if they don't, it won't be a Chimerican century, it'll be a Chinese one. Thank you very much indeed.
if I may, thank you for that but very lucid exposition, uh, and particularly for taking us back to history, the history of the Industrial Revolution, for inspiration. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. I'd like to take the first, and that's this. The inspiration of the Industrial Revolution, growth was based on real production. The structure of the advanced Western economies today is largely dominated, particularly the U.S. economy, by the financial sector and services. How does that factor into your analysis? Well, thanks very much, and I'm regretful that we don't have time uh, for more questions. I can't tell if that was because I overran or uh, my preceders, my, the preceding panel overran, but I'll offer a quick, a quick answer to this question, and then perhaps we'll have time for another. We've seen a hypertrophic growth of finance in the Western world in the last uh, 20 or so years. Uh, and I think there's no question that, that that will reverse itself. It is reversing itself now, if we get the regulatory framework right. The, the big nightmare is that we're going to get that wrong, uh, and that won't then reverse itself as it should. If we create uh, an institutionalized too big to fail, uh, then it'll continue to be a very attractive place for people to work. Uh, because it will, in effect, be uh, a set of institutions with a license uh, to print money. Now, banking and finance played a part in the Industrial Revolution, and one shouldn't write them out of the script. One of the points I try to make in The Ascent of Money is that most of the time, financial innovation has played a positive role. And without Britain's uniquely developed bond market in the 18th and early 19th century, uh, it's unlikely that the UK would have made the great advances uh, that it did in the course uh, of the 19th century. Uh, one of the things that I object to about the Krugman thesis is that it understates the extent to which financial innovation from around 1980 delivered higher economic growth worldwide. That there's a, a, a view that's beginning to take root because Adair Turner has said it and Paul Volcker has said it, that all financial innovation was socially uh, and economically useless. It was just a kind of scam to enrich Lloyd Blankfein. I think that's wrong. Uh, and I think it completely mistakes the, the, the role that finance played in the relatively higher growth rates we saw in the 80s and the 90s and right up until uh, 2007. So it, it's important, in my view, not to create a false dichotomy between manufacturing uh, and finance. Uh, I had a long-running argument uh, with my father-in-law, who was one of those people who believed that if you couldn't pick something up and, and hold it and throw it at somebody, it wasn't a real thing. Uh, and that people in finance weren't making real visible things that you could hit somebody with, and therefore it was an elaborate fraud. Uh, but we all know from our understanding of economics that value added is value added. And if you perform a valuable financial service, that is actually just as important as making uh, a widget. Uh, so yeah, let's keep clear of the uh, knee-jerk bashing of bankers. As I was saying to somebody earlier today, the more politicians bash bankers, the more you know they're trying to conceal their own role in this financial crisis. Fair enough. Hello, I'm Jay from India. So Lord Giddens talked about uh, the need for long-term planning to solve the present problems of the day. Now, how can we make long-term plans when we need to, and I think it is essential also, to have elections every four to five years? Isn't there a tension between these two worthwhile goals? And if yes, what can history teach us about this? Well, I'm glad. Uh, you asked that question. I wonder if I can reverse into one of my slides. Can we get the slides back up? Because India is a great advertisement in many ways uh, for not only democracy, but the rule of law and representative government generally. As you can see from this chart, the growth rate uh, of the Indian economy is currently significantly slower than the growth rate for China. On the other hand, it's a bit like the story, in my view, of the tortoise and the hare. The hare is hurtling ahead at the moment. But if you, reverting to the earlier discussion about population control, if you look at what the one-child policy is going to do to China in about 20 or 30 years, uh, it's going to trip it up in a really negative way. There's going to be a, a much, much less balanced 
uh, population, not only in terms of age, but also in terms of gender. There are huge mismatches between the male and the female population of some Chinese uh, provinces. This is not India's worry, uh, because India as a democracy couldn't engage in the kind of draconian interventions in human reproductive uh, decisions that Chairman Mao uh, was able to engage in. Long-term planning sounds great. Let's have a plan, a five-year plan, a ten-year plan. The trouble is that most such plans turn out, with the benefit of hindsight, to have been based on one wrong premise or another. This was the point that the great Friedrich uh, von Hayek made in his critique of planning, The Road to Serfdom, published at the end of World War II. The legacy of planning during the 1930s, when it had been the favorite activity of totalitarian regimes, ought to make us nervous. It ought to make us apprehensive. We ought to question our own assumptions. We ought to be open to the possibility that we're wrong. Much of what was discussed in the panel before I spoke was not really about risk at all. It was about uncertainty, things to which we can attach no meaningful probability. It's hard to plan for that stuff. What you can do is you can take out some insurance against the unknowable probability of climate catastrophe. But a plan, a long-run plan, to slow down economic growth in India and China because of an unknowable probability of some future climate catastrophe, that, that sounds to me like the kind of thing we'll look back on in 20 years and regret. Thanks very much. Neil, you've got another question right there. We have time for one more question. You, I didn't say that, you did. Oh. <laughs> there is suddenly elasticity in our schedule. Go ahead. What is the future of the euro? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me first say that I'm, I'm a historian, and so the future... Uh, <laughs> You wanted questions. Isn't really my, my field. Whenever I, I'm asked questions about the future, I always remind people that there's no such thing. There's no such thing as the future, singular. There is the past, singular, but there are only futures, plural. And when we're deciding what lies ahead, each of us, every day, is making a choice between futures. And it's our collective choices that ultimately produce that one future that happens, becomes the present and then is the past. So in the case of the euro, one has to be cautious here. It's tempting to proclaim the death of the euro. In fact, the editor of Newsweek has spent much of today trying to persuade me that that should be the headline of the article that I've written for his magazine, even though that's not what my piece says. That's journalism. What's clear is that the critique that some of us made back in 98-99 was correct. In 99, Larry Kotlikoff and I published an article called The Degeneration of EMU, in which we said that a monetary union with no fiscal union was bound to fail because there was no mechanism for transfers between member states, which clearly were going to have radically divergent fiscal uh, policies. And sure enough, at the first major shock, the system has, in fact, begun to unravel. The Greek tragedy, as I was trying to show you with some of those slides, is only the first part uh, of a southern European uh, tragedy that's going to play out over the weeks and months ahead, because there really aren't significant differences between the fiscal positions uh, of Greece, Portugal, Spain. And to some degree, one also has to include Italy in this story. Uh, of course, there are differences. Some countries are more reliant on foreign funding than others. Some countries' public debts are much larger than others. But they are all in a fiscally critical state, as the Bank for International Settlements and the International Monetary Fund agree. So what's going to happen? It's really a fascinating question. The scenario that seems to be least likely is that the whole thing disintegrates and there is no euro. The costs for everybody concerned would be very high of dismantling it. The Greeks would not gain from a sudden return uh, to the drachma, whatever uh, they may think. So a more likely scenario, once again, I'm offering you a number of futures here, is that 
uh, the European Central Bank is going to have to adopt a much laxer policy uh, in order to prevent a massive banking crisis. As these sovereign debts blow up, uh, it impacts directly on the ba balance sheets of banks, not only in the uh, so-called pigs, but also in France and in Germany, the core countries of the European project. The Lehman Brothers event hasn't happened in Europe yet. It might. The position of European banks is, in fact, worse by many measures than the position of American banks. And I think in order to averse a Lehman-like event, the ECB is going to have to throw its own rules out of the window and start treating the junk bonds of Southern Europe as if they are as good as German bonds. They've kind of already begun doing that. What that means is that the euro is going to be a weak currency. That's not great news for Swiss entrepreneurs who are planning to export uh, to the eurozone. We're in the world of competitive currency devaluation. Britain is about to embark on another great sterling slide in the wake of yesterday's disappointing election result. Uh, from the point of view of the United States, this is also very problematic. Uh, people still regard the US dollar as a safe haven for some mysterious reason. I've been saying that US treasuries are a safe haven the way Pearl Harbor was a safe haven in 1941. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, it's really quite hard to choose between these different fiat monies. Uh, and that's why the Chinese, of course, uh, are shifting out of currencies altogether and into commodities. But that's another story. There, two futures. I think the more likely one is that the euro is with us, but it's a weaker euro. Remember, it was a relatively weak currency right at the beginning. I think it's going back towards dollar parity and even lower. Thanks very much. Very enthusiastic hands up there connected to somebody. There we go. I hope, I hope you're not all dying to leave and wishing mm -hmm. that I would shut up. But I mean, we'll, we'll make, shall we make this the last one, Mark? Because I actually could use a drink. Yes, please. I guess Chinese and Americans are just those um, who want to shut up. I'm John. I'm, from, I'm a Chinese speaking with an American accent from China Europe uh, International Business School. My question would be, um, as we say, Chinese are definitely looking into buying, considering buying gold, but that will definitely have a negative impact in the world gold price. But my question here comes as, even if we look at the total GDP of China may overtake US in 2027. However, if you look at the population you know, base, the per capita, um, value is still significantly much lower. And then if we look at um, the long run, for example, US has been steadily growing. I mean, maybe not talking about the last decade, but steadily go growing for about a century by now. And Chinese, you know, only about three decades. And in, in that sense, and also take I mean, last point. Um, also taking into consideration of, for example, Harvard having around for 400 more years. Those talent pool that American institutions are able to produce will not be easily catching up uh, or caught up by Chinese. How do you see that um, in terms of competitiveness? Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Wonderful to have three questions disguised as, as one. Uh, I think the, the gold story is a really interesting one here. Uh, at one level, it makes no sense to load up your portfolio with a, a, a shiny yellow metal that doesn't pay any return and you can't use for much except jewelry. On the other hand, there's a momentum developing. Uh, and the momentum is being driven not just by uh, China and India, uh, it's also being driven by big hedge funds like Soros and, and Paulson. Uh, and momentum can sometimes be more important than fundamentals. I was a gold skeptic. One of my worst calls of the last 12 years uh, was when Gordon Brown started to sell the Bank of England's gold at $300 an ounce. And instead of going straight there and buying it all, I stayed at home. <laughs> I should have known that if Brown was selling it at $300, <laughs> It would be worth more than $1,000 today. Ugh. So I think gold probably has further to go. I'm not sure it'll get to 2000 but there's a lot of momentum building. And the more fear there is about paper money, the more ordinary investors uh, will say to themselves, you know what, 
I really need to have 10% of my portfolio in that form. So I think China could be part of a global uh, bull market in, in, in gold. Uh, the second um, point you raised is about per capita GDP. Yeah, it's going to take a much, much longer time uh, for Chinese per capita GDP to equal that of the United States. Some people say that will never happen. But that underestimates the possibility that per capita GDP in the United States could fall. After all, it's basically flatlined uh, for much of uh, the last decade, as you implied. And for unskilled Americans, it's not immediately obvious why uh, income should go up at all. Uh, the competitive challenge posed to unskilled labor by Asia is just unanswerable. Uh, and that seems to me to imply uh, that even if the per capita figures are, are robust, if you go down and look at, at median households, the story might be distinctly negative. Uh, but, you know, China is already, even in this much lower per capita GDP, the biggest automobile market in the world. It overtook the United States last year. And as more Chinese enter the middle class, that poses not only environmental challenges, which were discussed before, but it poses enormous political challenges for China itself. It's very hard to imagine a completely unchanged political system uh, under conditions of such dramatic social change. Certainly, uh, that would be completely at odds with the Western experience. In the West, remember, as incomes rose in the wake of industrialization, there was an inexorable move towards political representation. And those who resisted it always lost. In that sense, it seems to me that China has to grapple not only with environmental uh, concerns, but actually with a fundamental question about how its political system evolves. The last point you made is one very dear to my heart. Can the universities of the United States retain their preeminence mm -hmm. in research uh, and indeed in pedagogy? Right now, I have no doubt that Harvard University is the best university <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because the Chinese say so. Mm. Uh, in the ratings that are produced uh, by uh, one of the Shanghai universities, Harvard is consistently at the top. And what's striking is that by the Chinese measures, it's far ahead of the competition. Uh, Oxford, my old university, just sort of sneaks in to the top 12. But what's striking is how huge the gap is between number one and number 12 by, by these measurements. Now, I would never allow that to make uh, the academic entrepreneurs of my university complacent. The great danger, as any entrepreneur will tell you, is precisely when you're at the top, when you're number one. That's when complacency sets in. That's when bureaucracy sets in. That's when the entrepreneur is told to go and uh, work on his golf and leave it to the management. Uh, universities are, by and large, very unentrepreneurial places. I don't know if that's true of your university, but it is true uh, of all the ones that I've ever worked in. Uh, and nevertheless, despite that, they are necessary parts uh, of a modern economy. They do the kind of pure research that very often has no payoffs, to which there can't be attached any obvious risk-reward calculation. Many of us work at universities frankly, out of love, because the rewards are so poor that I have to have at least four professorships to get by. <laughs> <laughs> Can China replicate Harvard? <clears throat> Can it clone Stanford? That really goes right back to my second point. Can you have a flourishing, state-of-the-art university in a society that doesn't have political freedom? I'm here to tell you that I don't think you can. And perhaps on that note, uh, somewhat stirring note, I'll thank you all very much indeed. Good night. Fantastic. Support. Thank you.